Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us again um, for our webinar this evening. We are gracious enough to have Dr. Gary Mancy with us. He's going to be going over our Masters in Cyber or Masters in, of Science in Cybersecurity. Um, this program, of course, is, has a lot of interest right now, a lot of traction. Um, in the workforce right now so we definitely wanted to do a presentation to know what to expect with this program here at ECPI University at our online campus. Um, we also have Ajima and Daniel Figueroa here to assist us um, with any questions you guys might have as well with regard to getting set up and getting started. Um, so I will actually get ready to turn it over to Dr. Mancy. What you will notice as well at the bottom of your screen there's a Q&A. Under the Q&A, feel free to type in any of your questions at any moment. Um, that way we can definitely get those addressed for you. Um, and other than that, um, Gary Massey, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Howard. Yes, sir. Uh, all right, now I could just share my screen, right, Howard? With Yes, you're good to go. Okay, all right, folks, let me get started here. Let me share my screen. And we'll get going here. All right, you should see the uh, the presentation up here. You see it? Yes, sir. We're good. Oh, all right, good. All right, let me get it. Kick it off here. All right. Well, welcome to this this uh, this webinar. I'm gonna I'm I'm one of the the faculty with the uh, Computer Inf Information Science Group, um, and uh, for the the online campus at at ECPI University. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, very briefly, is about uh, the Masters of Science in Cybersecurity. Okay, and I, I got this graphic here from from the uh, Virginia Department of Education. I think it's a good graphic because you know oftentimes people talk about or they think cybersecurity is all about computers and and uh, information systems and and so forth. And really, when you get right down to it, cybersecurity is really one of the biggest pieces uh, of cybersecurity is people. All right, so I think this is a really good graphic, and uh, I know from my uh, teaching in this uh, in this program and teaching some of the courses, one of the uh, the biggest problem areas that we find are people. Okay, cybersecurity uh, and through through social engineering has a lot of issues dealing with people. Uh, so the the people element in cybersecurity is very key, and in just about all of our courses, we do talk about that that element. So that is always uh, always going on. And when I go over some of the courses later, we'll we'll uh, bring that up again. But uh, keep that in mind. People is one of the biggest pieces of uh, of cybersecurity. Okay, let's go to the first slide here. I like to call this my what, why, why, what, what's uh, presentation. This is the way I, I kind of like to, to do things, even uh, in the classroom, is, you know, what is the, the topic? Why is it important? Uh, what, you know, can we, can we do about it? And then what the final goal is here. So we're going to Kind of look at what is cybersecurity, you know, why is that important? What does ECPI have uh, to offer in that space? And what are the job potentials? That's probably what you're in interested in most. It's something I definitely would be. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, let's, let's go to the first slide here. Uh, cybersecurity, what is it? Well, in Webster's, it, you know, as you see here, measures taken to protect, uh, protect a computer or computer system against unauthorized uh, access. Um, some definitions of cybersecurity limit it to the information. And that is, that's, that's true in, in some respects, but it's really the, the entire computer system because cybersecurity issues can impact the hardware and software. Uh, one other definition that I've, I've found here, this a this, uh, little more broad brushed here, uh, refers to the body of, of technologies. And there's several different technologies that come to play in cybersecurity. Uh, and a practice is designed to protect networks, devices, programs, uh, data, 
And you know, as you can see, they're from damaged as well as unauthorized access. And uh, I'll, I'll give you some examples of how actual events out in the real world have caused physical damage through cybersecurity issues. All right, so let's continue on here. All right, um, what, why? Why is this important? Okay, one of the first things I'm going to call up on my screen, hopefully you'll be able to see this now. Uh, let me go to this real-time map here. Can you see this real-time map? Howard? Yes, yep, we, we're in. All right. This is uh, from a, a company that works in the cybersecurity uh, area, okay, Kaspersky. Uh, and this is a real-time live map, okay, globe, if you will, of cybersecurity attacks taking place. Now, there's all different sorts here, okay? And uh, some, of these, uh, uh, some of these attacks are, are really hitting against uh, what they call honeypots, okay, which are, are devices and systems that these types of labs set up, and they're, they're, they're like decoys. You know how, you know, when some hunters go out, they have uh, uh, ducks out there that are, are decoys, say? Well, uh, this is the same kind of thing. They look attractive to hackers, and sometimes hackers will hit them. So this is a way of kind of gauging what is going on out there, all right? But now some of these, though, are real attacks. So just to give you some indication of why cybersecurity is important, here's a good indication of it right here. Okay. All right. So now uh, let's go back. Turn the clock back somewhat, 2008, TJ Maxx. Now that's a, uh, a uh, department store, uh, but, but there were others that were involved in a, a breach here. And let me just click on this. I like to use real-time links in my presentation, so that way you can see that this is real-time data, all right? And you can go out there, you could look this stuff up. It's all over the place. You type in cybersecurity into just about any browser and you're gonna get a lot of hits. Okay, what happened in this case, and I think this was very uh, very important, just to show you how the thinking of cybersecurity has really changed. Back in 2008, when, when this one happened, uh, TJ Maxx and several other stores, I think they, they actually list them here. Uh, yeah, uh, Office Max, Barnes & Noble, so forth. <clears throat> they had very weak security on their on their wireless systems. Okay, uh, most of you, I'm sure, if you're if you're uh, listening to this, have uh, have some background in in uh, in information systems or computers, and would probably know that there's a uh, there's a security on wireless called uh, WEP W W E P. And that is uh, that is is um, a very weak security that is set up, and WPA and WPA2. And now I know I'm throwing a lot of terms out here. Uh, are are something that is really a lot stronger these days, and is what is the recommended. But back in that time, they used WEP, and that was one of the problems that they found. There were other issues. But this WEP security allowed hackers to do what they call war driving, okay? And these are all things that we teach our students through, through these, uh, uh, these courses. And especially at the graduate level, you have to be able to set up policies and systems, maybe not at the detail level of actually turning switches and running programs, all this other sort of thing, but set up policies because you're going to be responsible for them. If you're a chief information security officer, which some of our graduates uh, can be, then, uh, then you're going to have to set up the policies that are going to protect uh, against this. And in this case, with TJ Maxx, uh, the CIO was uh, somewhat lax. And I think when they did the investigation, they actually uh, you know, hit him uh, for this in terms of he should have had a lot more security. So they were very lax in it. And by war driving, what these hackers did was they just drove around in a car, okay? 
they drove through parking lots of some of these stores and they were able to find out what wireless systems were at that store because as we all know wireless systems aren't confined to the four walls they actually radiate outward okay and upward and we even uh, have had instances where there have been drones i think in in uh in uh, great britain they've actually uh tested this out where they've had drone aircraft flying over stores and and neighborhoods and so forth and being able to sense and pick up wireless systems and be able to tell what type of security those those systems had or didn't have okay so anyway in this case this is kind of what happened they finally caught these folks the security has been beefed up since then but it's a really good example of how uh you know by by really not paying particular attention to it to the security of your wireless system and thinking that well no one's going to be sitting in our parking lot trying to steal wireless well in this case they they actually did all right so let me close that one out uh stuxnet this is a really good one uh this is a uh it, it was billed as the the first digital weapon and there's a great book out uh, that talks all about this. But basically, let me let me click on the link here and and show you what happened. It was a a um, uh, there was a nuclear enrichment facility in uh, in the country of Iran. All right, and they were enriching nuclear material in order to uh, make it you know uh, make it um, uh, the grade that they needed to be able to put into nuclear weapons. All right, at least that's what the that's what the theory was there. Okay, so as they were doing this, some countries that didn't want them to to do this, and they have never quite uh, narrowed it or you know definitively uh, said which countries uh, they were. Uh, our country may have been involved in it, but there's no absolute proof of this. What they did was they developed a worm to be able to get into the uh, the manufacturing systems at this facility and get into these controllers that they call PLCs, and they stand for Programming Log uh, Logic uh, Controllers. And what they do is they interface between computer systems and the actual um, you know uh, device. Say in this case. There were these centrifuges that would spin this this uh, this uranium material at like thousands and thousands of, of RPMs and be able to make what they call fissionable uh, material out of it and nuclear grade uh, material and then be able to, you know, again, use that in weapons. Well, what they did was this worm got into the PLCs and it started to slow the, the centrifugal units down but very, very slightly. So slight that somebody monitoring it, like if the engineers were, were monitoring it, they wouldn't even know that anything was, was really going on. It was so slight. And the worm was also intelligent enough to seek out the PLCs of certain units and also to send false, uh, false data to the monitoring system. So long story short, this system uh, they they uh, what ended up happening was there were a lot of these centrifuges that uh, that went down and it just basically uh, interrupted and and just about stopped their whole nuclear program because of this worm. Now this is an excellent case of where something in the cybersecurity world had actual physical impacts. Okay. Um, one other thing here is the network that these centrifuges were on was what they call air gapped from the rest of the of the networks at this facilities. And what that means is, uh, you know, back in the old days when there was only wired systems, an air gap would mean there was no physical connection to, to the outside world. Well, in this case, there was not only no physical connection, but there was no wireless system either on, on these. But what they found out was the worm was introduced by, again, they had some help on the, on the inside, 
by a, a uh, one of their workers taking a thumb drive. We've all seen those little tiny thumb drives, and that it was an, there was enough room on there for it to to put it into one of the computers on the on the manufacturing side of that system and be able to introduce that worm. Once it was introduced, it spread. Now, what the scary thing was about this is that they have seen the, uh, I guess the outer shell, if you will, of this worm outside in the rest of the world. Even to this day, you can go out on the internet and you could find the code to build this shell. Now that's, you know, pretty scary, but by now it's been studied so much that a lot of the people that develop the systems to protect, uh, you know, for example, they could get into the controllers of, of power plants, of, of uh, water resource facilities and, and so forth, uh, air, air traffic control systems say, but they know enough about it now where they can recognize it. And a lot of the antivirus software uh, features that, that you run on your systems, what they look for are, are definitions. So they know what the definition of this is. But my point is, is that it was a, a, a worm that was built that now can be used for other things. So that's the scary part of, of this. So it's a, it's a constant effort for the people in cybersecurity, those of us that are, are professionals in there, to constantly be looking at what's the next weapon, what's the next, uh, what's the next worm, what's the next, uh, next virus. We constantly have to stay in front of this. So anyway, it's a very interesting one. If you want, this is the book here, Countdown to Zero Day, uh, a lot of good information. It reads like a detective story, and that's what a lot of this stuff is. Okay, uh, Target. This is uh, 2013. Uh, most of you probably recall uh, this one. Uh, 18.5 million, all right? That was the, the settlement. Now, that's, that's quite a bit of money. To Target, that, that may not be, but I know to me and probably the rest of us, it is. And again, they had a huge security breach. And a lot of these breaches, as I had mentioned, uh, it's, there's people involved in it with that Stuxnet. They had to get someone to actually put that uh, thumb drive uh, in. In, that, uh, in the TJ Maxx, it, it was a lack of, of their security people. And back then, security and cybersecurity was not as important and as in the news as it is uh, today. So they didn't put a lot of stock in, in, in some of these safeties that we're trying to do at, at this point. So, um, so anyways, Target uh, had a, a, a big problem there, uh, 18.5 uh, million, uh, and a lot of, of credit card information was, was stolen. So there's, there's, you know, if, if you want any reason to know why cybersecurity is very important, all you have to do is go out in, on the internet. News stories are all over the place. Okay. Hey, Dr. Uh, Massey. Uh, go ahead. Dr. Massey, so I, I have a question um, from someone in the audience. Um, in finding who did, um, did it when you were talking about um, Stuxnet, um, were any formal charges and punishment in place? Um, for those situations then? No, with, with, with Stuxnet, no, because they still, um, they still cannot pinpoint the countries even that were involved in it, okay? And if you read that, that book or you read any information, go out on the internet, there's a lot of information out there. There are some good guesses that they have, but because, these worms and viruses uh, have fingerprints on them. Cybersecurity is a lot like being a, a law enforcement person, all right? Uh, you look for different clues. So th when they looked at Stuxnet and they started to tear it apart, they saw some indications of, uh, of programming, say, that was done that had a certain type of signature look to it. And so that led them to believe 
that it may be from country A or country B, and, and actually they think it was a combination of, of possibly two countries. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know uh, myself exactly who had done it, but from the research, it looks like it was a collaborative effort and no one was ever caught and fingered with it. What it does show you though, is that there are some very, very clever people out there uh, on both sides, on the white hat side and the, and the black hat side, the white hat being the good guys, black hats, you know, bad guys, theoretically. Um, you know, there are some very clever people. So uh, even though there were some digital fingerprints, uh, so to speak, there was no, no one ever was charged uh, with it. Okay. But it was a very big deal. And it still remains, like that book says, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the first digital uh, weapons uh, that was developed. Uh, so, you know, Lord knows what's, what's, what's going on now. Good, good question. Uh, some of these other ones, TJ Maxx and Target, they were able to, to, uh, to find out who the perpetrators were. But oftentimes it is it is difficult, but they're getting better and better at it. Okay, uh, ransomware, ransomware, big thing in the news the, these days. Um, you know, where where companies are coming to work, and all of a sudden, instead of the blue screen of death, you see the red screen of of death. All right, and what happens in 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 these cases? Uh, is they will lock out your your uh, hardware. They'll they'll lock your your hard drive. They'll they'll encrypt it. They'll they'll make it so you won't be able to get to the information or the programs on your system. Now I always tell my students one of the best ways to guard against ransomware are to have a good backup. Okay, uh, I'm working on my my uh, MacBook here. And uh, it's got this, this time machine program, which does automatic backups. I mean, it works so automatically that I never, and that's the truth, I never do anything with it. I do have an external drive that I keep hooked up to, to it. So if someone were to ransomware my system, you know, I would say, okay, fine. Oh, you know, have a good time. I would take it, wipe the hard drive, then take my external drive and reload all of my software, applications, uh, data, but you need a good backup uh, system. You need one that's going to capture a complete image of your, of your machine. And so that's what this one does. Now, there are a lot of good products out there, so I'm not saying one over, over the other, but uh, to me, the best way to fight against ransomware is to ensure that you have your system backed up and then you could wipe your hard drive, uh, just wipe it clean. And, and if you take it to any, uh, you know, Geek Squad or any uh, professional uh, organization, they'll be able to do that for you if you're not handy with that, that stuff. And then you could reload your entire system. They don't really much care about the information, at least some of them don't much care about the information you have on your system, but they just want that ransom, okay? A lot of companies are willing to uh, pay for that. Uh, another good thing that I always tell my students is uh, encryption. Uh, if you notice up in the URL here on, the, on this browser, now this is, this is ECPI's browser that I'm going through, but even on my own browser, I always use HTTPS, okay? That encrypts information going over our system. So there's steps you can take uh, to, to make sure that if somebody is hacking your, your data, and one of the first things that we teach our, our graduate students uh, about are things like man-in-the-middle attacks. Now, just very briefly, what that is, somebody uh, gets in between you as the computer user and, like, say, your, your bank, and you're going through some Wi-Fi at, say, your local Starbucks, and they insert themselves in the middle of that transaction. And they do it with hardware and programs that are very cheap, you know, for like just a, a couple hundred bucks or less, you can get the hardware and software necessary 
to be able to intercept those signals, all right, that wireless, and be able to, uh, to then trick the user and the institution where the information's going into thinking that everything's fine. When really all along they are capturing information, passwords, usernames, all that sort of thing. Um, when you encrypt the information going back and forth, if they capture it, all they're going to get is gibberish. Okay, so there, there's a lot of ways to do it, and, and this isn't a, a discussion about how to do those things. But my, my point is, even with ransomware, that when this hit, I know people were going crazy about, oh, my God, you know, I'm not going to be able to get this information. Well, uh, there, you know, if, you're, if you've got a good backup going, <clears throat> and we should all have good backups. Backups are your best defense against any cyber issue. Um, and also here you'll notice, I don't know if you can see it, but it talks about a Tor browser. And um, what, what I'm, maybe now is a really good uh, point to, to show you exactly what that does. And this is some of the, these are some of the things that we teach our students in, the, in, this, in this cybersecurity program. Because again, as managers or supervisors or designers or analysts in that space, you have to know about all of these tools, okay? So let me go ahead and just stop that one. And before I go further, let me go ahead and I'm going to launch the Tor browser that I've got here, okay? And what this Tor browser does is it makes you completely uh, anonymous, okay? So what, what it allows you to do is Anyone, if there was somebody snooping this broadcast, okay, they would not know where, they wouldn't be able to know where I was or where I was going, all right? So, for example, let's just type in a very innocuous one. We'll do, we'll do CNN, all right? Try them. All right? Now, what this browser does, it, it, it masks, uh, it encrypts, the information going back and forth, but it basically hops around the world. And if I click over here, I'll show you from the browser that I'm sitting in, in, in Arlington, Virginia here, it went to Germany and then Canada, back to the US, somewhere in the US, and then out to the internet to CNN. Okay, so just by doing that, that is a good way to be able to fool uh, who's ever watching you, where you're going, what you're doing, and plus the information is encrypted going back and forth, all right? So there are tools like Tor, all right? Now Tor can be used by bad guys also, un unfortunately, that's the way the world is, that it could be used for good and bad, but these are tools that a, a cybersecurity analyst would would have to know about because one of the first things that you do as an analyst when you're working with with any kind of uh, organization or if you're a, a contractor doing work for them uh then the first thing you want to do is find out how much information you can about them how many holes there are in their public facing system and this would be one way all right let me go ahead and just close that off okay let's get back to our our presentation here Okay, so what does ECPI offer? All right, I just mentioned about our, our um, MSCS program, and you can view all this if you go out to, to our, our website. This is from the 2017 catalog, and it talks all about our cybersecurity program. All right, and so I'm not going to read all these outcomes to you, but they're all kind of listed here. What I, what I think I'd rather do, which you probably you know, I, hopefully you'll be interested in. Our, these are the, the core um, courses, okay? So, you know, these, these first uh, few courses give you the broad brush of what is cybersecurity, okay? What does it entail? What does it include? You'll soon find that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of policies, issues, uh, uh, regulations, there are a lot of, of uh, paradigms that you can follow. So if you're the C, uh, CISO, uh, Chief Information Security Officer, 
in some organization, or if you're one of the security analysts, there's a lot of, of policies that you can draw from to develop a good plan for your organization that fits what, what you know, you're doing. Because for example, a financial institution would not need maybe the same security as a manufacturing, all right? But they would be different. But you still need policies and good procedures put in place. Well, in our, in our first uh, couple of classes there, we give you a lot of what those policies and what are some of those organizations that you can turn to uh, that can give you that kind of, of information to be able to set something up for, for your particular site. Human and ethical aspects of cybersecurity, as I mentioned, one of the, the biggest challenges is what they call social engineering, right? And that's simply a hacker, and we've all heard stories of people getting phone calls from someone saying, hey, if you don't click on this link, I'm going to send you right now. Your computer's going to blow up and so forth. Uh, and they get information, or they get really friendly with you or they'll ask you cer certain questions, or you'll get an email from someone, and you don't quite recognize it, but it's got the logo of your bank or something on it. And so all those social engineering uh, issues we discuss because there, there are things that you need to look out for, and again, as, a, as an information security analyst or uh, professional, you wanna be aware of them, so you can make people aware of them, because your job as you know, in any organization, will be to make your organization aware of what all of the issues are. Okay, so that's kind of what those do. Cloud security, we've, you know, you've heard about cloud. Uh, I, I kind of chuckle with this. I've been in the, the information technology field for like 40 years now. And, you know, back when I first started, it was just called contractors. <laughs> it was called third-party contractors. Uh, what cloud, what the cloud is, is basically everything as a service. So you could put any word in there and then just put as a service after it. So for example, you could do storage as a service, software as a service, hardware as a, as a service. And all it means is that instead of you spending a lot of money as an organization, uh, uh, buying servers, buying, uh, um, buying software packages, some of them costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, they're huge. Uh, you, can, you can pay a, a company to be able to use their systems. Now, you'll be time sharing with, with other customers, but you won't know it, all right? So the cloud is really a conglomerate of being able to use uh, you know, different features, you know, some from column A, some from column B, and they're all connected by internet. The internet has revolutionized the way we do work. And actually, when I got into to, uh, information technology, the internet was just appearing, it was in its infancy. In fact, I was, it was my first graduate program. And, uh, and everyone knew it was gonna be a real game changer, but we never thought it would be this, this big. But it's all kind of tied together, and that's what the, what the cloud is. So don't get confused with, with cloud. Uh, systems. It's just all these different services that you can you can get that you don't need to do it with in house. You could do it outside. All right. Naturally, there's security with that. You've got their security has got to be top notch because remember, it's your information that's going out there. So if you're storing some of your employees' financial data on an HR system that's you know as a service out in the cloud there somewhere you got to make sure that that is very secure so there's a lot of issues there uh, architecture design how do you design some of these systems excuse me and and again your job as a as an information security analyst is to to kind of lead the charge on this and and put forth what the what does the what does a good security architecture and a, a design what are the elements of it what does it need to, uh, to contain to address all these vulnerabilities and threats that are, are out there? So we have that, our, our 521 course covers that. This is a real interesting one that a lot of students like. Network security and intrusion detection. That's a whole field in and of itself, intrusion detection and, and intrusion uh, prevention. Uh, 
whole field. And in that course, I just taught that one two terms ago, and we use we use some lab tools where you actually go in and you do you uh, your your job is to to go in there and test these systems to see can an intruder get in because potentially that would be one of the jobs you would get as a cybersecurity professional is be an intrusion detection and and uh, prevention specialist that would go in and test these networks, all right? Sometimes the, uh, the people working in those organizations know about it. Sometimes you go in and, and uh, the only person that knows about is the person who hired you, usually the uh, CIO say. And so th there's a lot of different elements to that. But again, it, it's trying to penetrate the walls, penetrate their firewalls, pen penetrate all the systems they have and even be able to find out what's freely available on the internet about that company that might be a, a security risk to them. Okay, so there's there's a lot of elements of that. That's a very interesting course. I'm just finishing up teaching this wireless and mobile security one. Needless to say, we all have cell phones, right? I mean, everyone's got got one of these, and uh, that is a is a huge area. It's growing by leaps and bounds now. One of the questions from one of the, the viewers that I, I answered earlier today was, what do you think the next big thing is in cybersecurity? I think it's the Internet of Things, okay, IoT, um, which basically means you've heard of uh, smart cars, Tesla. You know, Tesla does most of their downloads wirelessly through the cell phone system, okay? So when they're updating the software in the car, it's coming wirelessly. It's coming through the cell phones. Um, and so when you look at, you, you know, houses, smart houses have thermostats and alarm systems that are all based on some central location sending out updates to them, all right, or responding to them. So to me, the Internet of Things, as that gets more and more pervasive throughout our, our, uh, our society, security is going to have to keep up with it. OK, and right now, I think it's like we're almost waiting to see what kind of attacks are going to take place and how are we going to defend uh, against them? So uh, I think that's a real growing area. So if you're looking at an area to specialize in 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 cybersecurity, I think the Internet of Things, uh, that's the next big leap, I think. Of course, there's so many other things that are going on. Virtualization is one of the areas we cover, you, you know a lot about virtual, virtual storage and, and so forth. Uh, basically meaning like for a storage uh, system, you could have pieces of your information stored all over the country at different places. To you, it looks like one virtual piece, all right? And there's also uh, uh, running uh, vir uh, virtual systems. We do uh, a lot of our labs. The labs that I talked to you about that I mentioned that we did the, the intrusion detection on, we were attacking virtual servers. Now, they weren't actual servers that were set up. There were some, some uh, Linux boxes. And, but, but from a, a, a computer perspective, they were there. We thought we were working on a normal Linux box when it really didn't exist. It was a virtual box. And I've got a little graphic I'll show you later of some of the tools that we use. All right. Hey, uh, Dr. Mancy. Go I'm ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, I do have something. Um, one of our, our, our viewers is mentioning something about it is extremely dangerous. Going back to what you were previously talking about, the IOTs, um, they're sold um, and companies never patch them. Um, it is literally software waiting to be hacked. So that was a comment that was made. Um, Absolutely. Followed by another, another viewer. Um, talked about recommended certifications of CISSP and CCNA. Um, I understand that they are not required. However, if you are certified in um, certified in any of these, are their college benefits courses tested out based on attaining these certs and the requirements that they demand prior to taking these certification exams? Yes, uh, for, uh, two uh, two things there. One, uh, you know, anything, you know, anytime you're you're updating systems and and anytime software is moving, all right. It 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 used to be that 
systems and system software was not in danger unless it moved, okay? But as we see from Stuxnet, I mean, they had all their data on this air gap, quote, air gap network that they thought was absolutely secure, and that wasn't, okay? But uh, anytime information is moving, uh, security has got to be tight on them. So, so uh, you know, absolutely, that's got to be paid attention to. But again, you know, making sure that you have backups, you have ways to, to know whether the the software and the systems that you sent to the the uh, the particular uh, area actually made it there, and was it the correct one? Okay. So, um, and then as far as the uh, uh, certifications go, uh, yes, we even mentioned here uh, ECPI has has programs that will help you get your certification. And um, I don't know the number for, for graduate students, but there are some number of certifications that ECPI will actually help you uh, obtain. And, and, and when I say obtain, then we can get you practice exams for some of them. And we also can get a very, very deeply discounted rate on the uh, uh, cost of these, of of most of these all right and some of these tests cost hundreds of dollars okay and and the the discounted rate I know for some of them are like 15 to to 20 dollars okay so uh, there's not an unlimited supply of these that that we can can help out with and you have to meet cer certain qualifications but that's something that if you're in the cybersecurity program you would want to talk to your to your uh, advisor your uh, program uh, director, and uh, they would be able to help you out with that. But certifications are huge. Uh, when I was Dr. in, I, uh, go ahead, Doctor Massey. I was going to let Daniel go ahead and answer that question because a couple of people started asking how many vouchers are available. Daniel, can you speak to that for us real quick? Uh, yes, there's uh, currently um, two vouchers available for the graduate certification program. Um, and um, at this time, uh, you could go as you start as a student in the program, um, you can speak with your student services coordinator um, and also I'll speak with the, the director um, of the program itself um, to kind of see where you stand and also get advice on where to study, how to study. And also, as you go through the program, at what point do you, would you be the, the most qualified to take that certain certification? Because right. the last thing you want to do is rush into a certification just because you could take it. You want to get advice on kind of where you stand so you have the best success right. and not waste your voucher uh, at the same time. Yes, that, that's very true. And there, and there's certain, the reason why we would have, we have certain requirements for, uh, for you to get that voucher is because of, of just what Daniel mentioned. We want you to, to be successful. And so we want to make sure that you've got the skills and the, and the knowledge because these certification exams uh, are not easy, okay? But they do tell a, a future employer that you know you are certified you're certified in, in in certain areas cisco certifications are are very big and they tell an employer uh, a lot so getting any of these cybersecurity, network security uh certifications is a is a very good thing and it's something worth uh pursuing and again a lot of study has to go into it not only through our courses but through through your own uh outside study so, Dr. Massey, I have another question coming in. Some of these are above my um, head. So, um, how much Python knowledge is required throughout the program? Um, not, not really. Well, let's see. I, I won't say none, but, but if you have a basic knowledge of any kind of programming, like with, with, uh, with Python, which would be, you know, very basic. If you have JavaScript, uh, uh, Java. Uh, any of those, I think the most you do is in the, and I haven't taught these classes, but I think in the encryption, yeah, in the in the uh, applied uh, cryptography, uh, they do some scripting. But no, you don't have to know a lot of uh, programming. And and from from this perspective in cybersecurity, you're dealing more with tools, okay? And some of the tools that cybersecurity uses to be able to det uh, detect what the vulnerabilities are. 
And so you're not doing, you're not building uh, uh, systems per se that you would need any kind of in-depth programming. But having some programming background is always a benefit, definitely. Okay, one more question, a clarification question. Um, and sorry to hold you up here, but um, it's a good question. I already have my CISSP. However, I do not have my master's. Is having my certification of CISSP reducing the amount of courses that I am able to attain my master's degree? Example, yeah. reducing the number of semester credit hours from 42 to 21. Is that something that you would need to look at on a case-by-case, -case, um, Dr. Mancy? Yeah, right. At, at, at this point, now th that would be subject to our, I mean, our, our, our dean would have to weigh in uh, on that. We're, we're only allowed to give uh, uh, transfer credits for other, uh, other college courses from, courses from colleges and universities that are, that are accredited by the same type of instit uh, institution that, that ECPI is. ECBI has has uh, has their accreditation through uh, through SACS, the what is it, Southern Association of, of Colleges and, and Schools, and so that is a very well known certification uh, body, and and so we can we can sometimes take uh, we don't do it a lot in the graduate programs because usually at the graduate level there is a reason why you need to take that 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 graduate course. In the undergraduate uh, uh, courses, we do a lot more of transfer credits in, but we are allowed to do some, but that's really on, like like Howard said, on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. But to my knowledge, we do not and, and, and have not given any uh, credits for any certifications. Um, just that's, that's not something that I think any colleges typically do. We also have to make sure that we follow, uh, like I said, our, our accreditation comes from SACS, so the, the Department of Education uh, kind of dictates what we can take from a, a transfer uh, perspective, okay? Thank you, Dr. Good, Massey. Good, uh, good, good questions, though. I just want to mention very briefly, in the cybersecurity program, then you could break off uh, into two, uh, two you know, areas depending on what your what your interests are. This is more of if you really want to look at more of the hands-on work. Like I said, there's this this uh, this cryptography uh, course, which I hear here is really really good. To me, uh, cryptography is the key to a lot of our issues because if the data is encrypted, then so what? <laughs> you know, if they if they rob the data going across the lines, who cares? If they can't figure out what it says, then it's not going to do them much, uh, much, you know, much good. Advanced ethical hacking, very, very popular these days uh, because of naturally all the hacks going on out there. Cyber forensics, I think this is an area that's going to explode more and more too. Because as I mentioned, a lot of these uh, worms and viruses have fingerprints. And so they leave behind telltale signs that then the, the cyber forensics people go in and just like a, a, a forensics group for, for crime will go in and take a look at things and say, boy, this looks like such and such. And, and so there's a lot that, uh, you know, that can be told. So if you like that kind of more technical area, I think that would be really good. Security policy, I think, is more for people that want to go into more of the supervisory uh, role. You know, as, as you can see here, there's a whole section on cyber, uh, cybersecurity governance and, and uh, compliance. When you see all the regulations and so forth, uh, when I was in the private sector, we had to certify our, our, our systems five, 10 different ways because of the uh, compliance issues, financial records, uh, uh, human resource type, and, and so there, there's a lot of things that you have to do. So if you want to look at security more from setting up the policies and setting up the systems from a, from a higher level, then, then I think this would be, uh, this area of security policy would be, would, would be good uh, for you. And these electives down here are really just a repeat of, uh, of these. Okay, uh, good questions. Thank you very much for them. Let me go back now. 
Uh, okay, I want to mention some of the tools we use. VCastle, uh, uh, NetLab, we call it NetLab, is really a, a tool that we use to manage some actual hardware that we, that we actually have in our, in our uh, data center. And it allows us to configure them and then have the student go in and, and be able to have it all set up for them. So it, it's, a, it's kind of virtual and, and, and kind of hardware-based where if, you are, if you're working on, say, some routers and switches and you want to build this network, then we can, we can configure all that for you and then have you go into the system and be able to use that. And, and you, you know, one thing I like to tell online students is in the online environment, you are working in the environment, you are studying in the environment that you're going to be working in, all right? And, and you know, uh, when I, again, uh, when I first started several years ago, it was a lot of going into a data center, bringing in big hardware, you know, racks and stuff like that, and setting up servers and, and so forth. Well, uh, nowadays, you do a lot of that from your screen. All right. So a lot of the time that you're going to be spending, especially in the cybersecurity world, is going to be in front of your screen. So if you're going to be using those tools in a virtual sense, then to me, virtual learning is a good way to do that because you get very comfortable with it. All right. You're sitting at your screen. You're you're using some of the tools that that real folks use when they're working on these these uh, these systems out in the, the real world. Zen Desktop is a way that we allow you to be able to, if you don't have all the Office products and so forth on your system, no problem. In fact, I'm using uh, uh, one of them to, to do this presentation. You can go into Zen Desktop and it's got all these different uh, uh, programs, applications, and, and so forth. Uh, iLabs is something, and I wanted to show you, I think on the next slide I might have it. This is a screenshot of of uh of iLab and basically you know as i mentioned here you know this is uh, these are the virtual systems now iLabs is it's totally virtual so uh even though this says uh this is a windows 7 subnet here and we got a uh cal uh cali linux subnet here those are virtual all right they're as real as real can be but they are virtual all right and uh, in, in this particular interface with, with iLab, this is just one of the tools that our, our students use, uh, you are thrust into the real world here. And so you've got this command line screen, you gotta type in, uh, in uh, commands and people that aren't used to using command line screens get a little intimidated by it, but it's really a great way to, to do uh, business with a computer. You have to know exactly what you want to say to it, and it'll tell you if you don't get it right. But when I, you know, again, when I first started, this is what they used to have. Now and now, they're uh, nowadays they they are going more back uh, to this uh, this type of interface because you can get right to the heart of what you want to access in a computer by going to command prompts, then you know tapping through Windows and all this other stuff. But this interface is is really pretty slick. It's uh, usually it'll have instructions over here or the types of machines. It'll have screenshots to tell you what you should be looking at. So when a student has a lab to do, they would come into an interface like this and they would go into this lab and they'd do it. Now, some of these labs can take two or three hours. All right. Now, you don't have to do them all at once. The beauty part of it being virtual is you can save your progress and then you could come back to it. So we use a lot of tools like this that give you the real world view of what you will be using. And so uh, I think this iLab two tool is really good. Uh, got a good response from, from students. And we're always testing out new tools. ECPI, especially the online campus, we've got to stay up on these virtual tools because our world is the virtual world, right? We're coming to you. We want you to be able to use these tools and get the experience as if you're actually there. Okay. Hey Gary, I have another, um, Dr. Massey, I'm sorry. I yep. have another question. Um, I'm currently in the CIS program working towards my bachelor's degree in network and cybersecurity. What right. are the differences in obtaining a job be um, between the bachelor's and the master's? 
that's the first part of the question. I'm going to answer the second part um, because he has that one here, and that's about certifications. Um, how many certs do you get as, at a, the bachelor's level? At the bachelor's level, you qualify for, um, if you're graduating from ECPI, you qualify for five vouchers um, to be used while you're a student. Um, and that you can actually use 15 of those. I mean, five of those. You can use five of those, they cost $15. As a graduate, you get another five, so you would um, altogether have 10. Then if you start for your master's, you get another two. So ECPI students that graduate from the, um, that are in school, they actually get five certifications. Once they graduate, they get another five um, after they, um, just to continue their education as they're going through. Okay, Dr. Massey, back to good. you. The yeah, great. No, that, that was good information. All right, let me answer the question I had by going to the next slide. What is the job potential? That's what we're all uh, interested in here. So this first one comes from the Bureau of, of Labor uh, Statistics in our, uh, in our government. And I think the question was about with his bachelor's uh, degree. Well, here you go right here, bachelor's degree, median pay, 92600 per year. I don't know about you, but I think that's a pretty darn good <laughs> uh, pay there. Um, so that's what you can do with a, uh, with a bachelor's. Now, will every degree or every job give you this? Absolutely not. I mean, if, if they were, they, they probably wouldn't be here. But, but there are enough jobs out there that can definitely start you off at a higher, uh, you know, definitely a higher pay level than say if you were graduating, you know, and I don't want to be prejudiced about any other degrees or anything, but if you were getting a liberal arts degree or something and didn't have a, a, a area that was as, um, as wanted and as sought after as cybersecurity or information systems, period, we get more uh, employers, we have these, um, uh, these uh, advisory board meetings where the employers, we sit down with them, we talk and say, what are you looking for? And they keep telling us, we don't have enough cybersecurity people. We don't have enough IT, uh, uh, IT specialists, database programmers and so forth. So there is a big market out there, okay? So with a bachelor's degree, now, you know, we definitely start out that, uh, you know, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, with a master's degree, you know, I would, I, uh, I always feel that if you want, it's really the type of job. This is more of an, of an analyst position, all right, which usually at the bachelor's level, this is ma mainly what you're shooting for, but that doesn't mean that at a, at a, at a master's level, you wouldn't be able to do this, this same work. And excuse me, the beauty part about having your, your master's degree is most companies uh, the, the next rung up on the, on the ladder for promotions and so forth is you, usually getting an advanced, uh, an advanced degree. So if you come in with a bachelor's, I mean, uh, you know, that's fine. But then you would be looking to get that master's, uh, master's de degree at some point. Usually getting your master's degree allows you to start off at a, at a higher rung. All right. Not all the time. Not, not every job. Uh, I think I've got some some other here. Let me uh, let me show you just to to, to kind of look at. Okay, here we go. This is from uh, from Indeed. I think a lot of you probably know what the the Indeed uh, uh, database is. Uh, good job site. Okay, so a lot of the graduates from a master's program would be looking at more like a director of of information security. Okay, sixty two ninety per hour or one forty three per year. Okay, pretty good. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's that's a good uh, a, a good salary. You come out of grad school and start making, you know, even close to that, even just at the six figure range, is very good. It it uh, security specialist. All right. Uh, again, with a with, with a master's degree, the master's degree is going to give you a leg up on someone coming out with a a bachelor's degree. Although, as you can see, with a bachelor's degree, you're coming out pretty good, too. So it's really a win-win situation. There is no hard and, and, and fast uh, formula. It's more of how fast do you want to start making those rungs up that, 
that ladder because I can guarantee just about any company that I've ever worked for, uh, when you look at what's my career growth pattern, they always say advanced degree, advanced uh, degree, and that's at the master's level. Uh, Dr. Mancia, this is Daniel. Yes. Just to expand on that, um, and um, Ajima, my colleague, could probably speak to this as well. Um, I would say probably almost half of the students I speak to who are interested in the graduate level program in cybersecurity are usually coming to me because there's an opportunity with either within their certain company or other opportunities outside their company, sure. but they require that they have the master's degree. So even if they have a decade worth of experience, um, they might still get the job, but right. in the very competitive market that is coming you know, right. much sooner than later, that master's degree is gonna be your a key um, on you know, right. your seat at the table. So I you always tell people to, you know, use think of it as an investment, move, move it towards the, the master's right. degree because one, there's not as many people at this point in time with a master's degree in cybersecurity than wow. the market really wants at the time. So you're going to be in higher demand than pretty much everyone else. Yeah. And two, five, 10 years, 20 years down the line where there might be more people out there with the master's degree, you don't want anything holding you back career-wise because you are the only one who did not get one. That's that uh, very well done, yes. Uh, you want something. I was always told when I would you know, be uh, going to, to any job interview, the advice I always got was you want to differentiate yourself, okay? So you don't want to be, you know, and as, uh, as Daniel just mentioned, uh, you know, there's not a lot of cybersecurity folks out there uh, with, with uh, seeking jobs. But as that gets more and more, you don't just want to be one of the ones that has their cybersecurity, uh, cybersecurity degree, period. You want to differentiate yourself. And the way to differentiate yourself is show that you've got the skills necessary to take it to that next phase. Okay, so that that's 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 great advice. All right, and just, I chirp, I and just to chirp in, Dr. Mancy, if you don't Go mind. Um, in addition to the master's degree, if you are coming into the master's degree and you don't have the undergraduate studies in um, cybersecurity or network security, it's a great opportunity for you to use the certifications to help leverage yourself. Um, because in addition to the higher level education, having those certifications are really going to help you um, as far as being attractive to potential employers. Yes. And I just wanted to make a slight um, abbreviation to what... Um, um, Howard had mentioned before as far as the certifications are concerned and um, if you are looking to see which certifications you would be able to access through the master's degrees we actually do have them listed on the website oh. so um, the specific certifications that the programs will actually help develop you for um, they are actually available to you there and um, if you're talking to one of us we can definitely expand on it for you more and um, if you're an undergraduate student and if you're if you happen to be in that position you do have access to five certifications and um, you will have access to an additional two certifications once you're on the master's level so that's a total of seven opportunities for certifications in total it's great it's great thank you okay um, uh, oh. dr massey i have one other thing i'm gonna have um ej um address um, i have a question coming in um how does ecpi actually help with getting jobs well, let, let me just, I, I'll throw my two cents and I'll let, I'll let Daniel and, and EJ go, go on that. But I, uh, um, uh, ECPI to me, and, and, you know, we don't advertise our, our placement rate. And so I, I'm not going to throw out any, any, any numbers here. I don't want, want our, our, our president to, to, to get on me, but it's high. It's higher than, than just about any institution I've ever gone to or uh, heard of, and, and our, our career services group, they do a fantastic job of, of putting you in touch with uh, employers, and, and I think that ability to use them lasts a long time. Uh, you could probably address that uh, better, but it is, it, it is a great advantage, and they do an excellent job of setting you up and, and if you're in the undergraduate program, we have externships too, which I know I always push students into because I think it's a good way to get your foot uh, in the door. But I'll let you folks, uh, Howard, you and, and Daniel and 
and can can maybe talk about that more. Okay. Yeah, as far as career services, we do, again, as Dr. Mancy had indicated, we do have a career services department um, that you all will be able to work with. Um, the career services department, they network with you directly, they take a look at your resume, and they help you as far as leveraging your skills while you're in school. Um, the smartest way to use them is when you start your classes, go ahead and meet with one of the advisors. Um, they can take a look at your resume, and um, they can kind of give you an idea as to what um, potential employers would be looking for. So if it's smart for you to um, leverage yourself with uh, the certifications, they can actually point you in the right direction and actually communicate that with you so that you can also communicate um, with your program managers and um, your instructors just so um, you can um, be well aligned as far as um, putting a plan in place for that. Thank you, Eli. You're welcome. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, let me uh, let me go ahead with my. Okay, yeah, I thought that was my my uh, my final slide. Those are just my references. Since we are an academic institution, I just wanted to make sure that I did list the the references that I've I've used here. But um, uh, I don't know whether this will be. Uh, I I think it it may be uh, recorded. Is it Howard? Is this presentation recorded? Yes, it is. Okay, so you could go back and you can look at some of the sites that that I had uh, I had gone to. I just want to go to my last slide here. It's got my my contact information on it, um, and this is my my phone, voice or text. This is my email, and again, I'd be glad to talk to anyone about any uh, any of our programs. Uh, I've been with ECPI for about uh, eight uh, eight years now. And so uh, I've taught several of the of the different courses, and it was a pleasure doing this. Cybersecurity, uh, it didn't. Uh, my my doctorate is is actually in, in information systems, which is a little more uh, broad brush. Uh, but I've recently, in in the past few years, have been involved more and more in the cybersecurity. And I'll tell you, it is an interesting field. I love being part of it because it changes constantly. And we constantly, as I mentioned, have to stay ahead of, of what the uh, uh, what the world is is doing. And each new technology challenge that gets put out there, like smart homes, smart cars, and you know uh, the whole Internet of Things, we have to be ready to uh, to be able to protect that. So anyway, it was my pleasure. That's all I've got. If uh, you've got any other questions, Howard, um, I do. So one question that I have. Um Dr. Messi, and it might be more towards Ijoma or Daniel, um, how long does the program take and how are the classes structured? Um, and if you can answer this um, in regards to students that are currently attending ECPI for their undergrad, the differences, um, so forth and so on. Um, I, you want me to take it, Ijoma, or you want to take it? Um, you can go ahead and take it, Daniel. Okay. <laughs> um, Basically, it breaks down like this, especially to any of you who might be ECPI alumni. Um, our undergrad structure is normally two classes every five weeks. On the graduate level, we want our students to really take in this information, and also mainly because the demands and the workload on the graduate level is pretty intense, so we want our students to really take it all in. So we put it down to a one class every five week schedule, and that is continuous. So after you're done with week five, the very next Monday, Day, start to another five week uh, uh, term um, and you keep on going on until all 12 classes are completed the estimated completion time for the program it takes about 16 months um, to complete everything in the program right and and if I could just throw one thing in from from my perspective as a, as a faculty and talking with a lot of students that have, have gone through our, our graduate uh, program uh, I always tell our, our undergraduate students that you have to do, you get into the habit of doing something every day. If you do something every day, even if it's a small something, you'll never fall behind. And that is the big uh, issue. I've, uh, I've taken online courses. It's very easy to uh, procrastinate. But in the graduate program, you really have to try to do that because graduate program means graduate work. All right, so it is, it's tough. It's not the typical 
uh, undergrad, not that undergraduate work is, is easy. Believe me, there's a, you know, a lot of that undergraduate work is very, is very difficult. But graduate work requires extra effort. But keep in mind while you're in this uh, program what your goals are, and you wouldn't be in the program if you couldn't handle it. Okay, so, um, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, there, there are good programs. It'll be well worth it when you finish. It'll open new doors for you. So that's just my two cents there. Okay. Dr. Massey, I actually had someone who was, um, had a question about one of the slides. He said you didn't cover CIO, the article on CIO. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I could, I could, I could go back. That really, that was just a, a kind of a catch-all article, but good, good catch there. What it is basically was, I just wanted you to to see this. Okay, cybersecurity pros in high demand, highly paid, and highly selective, which goes back to what was said uh, before: is that you know at, at this field, I don't think there's ever going to be uh, enough people in this field, but if you have something that really differentiates yourself, like a master's uh, degree, then that's going to show prospective employers that this person is really serious. They're already out there. They're already learning the advanced uh, techniques and tools that uh, we're going to need. So, so to me, that one headline there says a lot. Okay, so but a good catch there. Thank you for for bringing that up. I really wanted to use that that point. Thank you, Dr. Massey. Daniel or EJ, is there anything else you guys feel like um, we need to um, answer in this webinar? Well, um, I know a lot of students usually have um, just a couple really quick questions, and I'll just hit them off real quick. Um, a lot of them are, uh, are really uh, interested on when to start. Is going to be uh, that's a very important thing um, currently we are scheduled um, right now to start October 2nd um, which is approaching quickly and matter of fact the cutoff date uh, for applicating to uh, applying to the program actually going to be in mid-September so if you are interested in the program please uh, reach out uh, to myself Howard Moses or uh, Ajima and we'll be more than happy to help you out in that regard um, the process uh, to apply for the program is fairly smooth um, and uh, everything from the process uh, will be guided with you uh, through myself, Ajima, um, throughout this entire process. Also, um, if you are coming to this program fresh and you have your bachelor's degree, just some of the minimum requirements. Um, we do require a uh, cumulative GPA from an accredited university of 2.5 or higher in the program. But if you're slightly below the 2.5, don't panic. Uh, we do require a GRE or GMAT, which are nationally recognized tests, um, which means they're not part of ECPI. They're nationally re recognized tests in the same vein of, let's say, the SAT back in high school. But these are for uh, students who earned the bachelor's degree going towards their master's. So if you're under 2.5 cumulative, uh, you have to take one of those. But if you're over 2.5, uh, we're more than happy to assist with any questions you have. And I know those are usually the two real basic ones that a lot of students want to know. That way they could plan for their future, hopefully with ECPI. CPI. Perfect. Thank you. EJ, anything else? Um, no, I think he touched base on everything. Basically, what occurs is that if you are interested in moving forward, um, you would contact either myself or Daniel. And what we would do is we would go through the interview process with you. So we do definitely want to get to know you more, get to know what your career goals are, make sure that we are um, pointing you in the right direction as far as this program is concerned. I do believe by this time you should know. Um, Dr. Mancy was extremely thorough and he did an excellent job with really um, highlighting some of the um, more detailed points of this career field. So um, you would just um, get in contact with us. What we do is we help you transition um, and move through the process of really being able to transition into the best cohort for you. Now, if you are considering this program and you don't have a cybersecurity background, um, we will be talking to you about um, what would be uh, the, uh, the processes for your situation specifically, um, because it will vary depending on uh, your background. Thank you, EJ. Um, well, thank you everyone for your participation. It was really, really good questions, great insight. Again, Dr. Mancy, thank you so much for your time this evening. I will be sending the video out to everyone. Everyone probably has my email at this point. Don't hesitate to reach out to me so I can get you over to 
um, Ijoma or to Daniel and get you squared away. Again, have a great evening and thank you everyone. Bye-bye. That was good. Thank you. Bye-bye.